Good morning and welcome to another lecture of DP 4165, Computational Heat and Fluid Flow. Last time we started with the finite volume method for the heat equation. And we found out by the finite volume discretization we get the system of all the differential equations. So that was the system 9 that we can write like this. It's the time derivative of the vector t which contains our finite volume approximations to the temperature in each cell. These are the cell averages that we approximate. And on the right hand side we have a right hand side vector which depends on time if we have time dependent boundary conditions but it depends all on the unknowns. And we found out for an equidistant grid this right hand side will look uh, like that and that was uh, 11a that we had that the first component R1 uh, will be alpha which is the thermal diffusivity divided by the grid spacing delta x squared and then we have here the T2 that is the approximation to the cell average in cell number 2 minus 3 times T1 the cell average temperature in cell number 1 plus 2TA which is the temperature that we give at the left boundary and if that would be time dependent the time dependency would come in there then we had the um, general form 11B that was the RJ that is the form that we also have for the finite difference method where we have the TJ plus 1 minus the 2TJ plus the TJ minus 1 and that is then true for J from 2 to NJ minus 1 NJ is the number of control volumes that we consider the last one 11C, that is the R on NJ, there the right boundary condition will enter, we will have alpha divided by delta x squared, and we will have here two times the temperature at the right boundary, Tb, minus 3 Tnj, and plus Tnj minus 1. So, and we argued we can then do a discretization in time of this system of order differential equations. Last time we have already looked at the explicit Euler method, which is straightforward. That is the one that we are going to do in exercise 2. And if you like, you can also do the implicit Euler method. That was the one that we were uh, discussing last time. And so that was the implicit Euler method. And in there, we do the discretization in such a way that we discretize this by a straightforward uh, difference operator. It's actually the backward difference operator that we use there. At the new time, distribution at the new time divided minus at the open divided by the uh, time step size delta t. And the, on the right hand side, we have the uh, right hand side at the new time. If we would consider the t, it would be at the new time, but in our case we did not do that, but we can do it, it would be like that. So what we do is we multiply by delta t and bring that on the left hand side, so then we get the tn plus 1 minus delta t times r. And now to make it easier we just skip this dependence and we have then the tn plus 1 and then that is then equal to and on the right hand side we will just have the, the Tn we have already seen what this gives for this equation here now we want to see what it gives for this equation for the R1 so we just have then to consider the first component that is then the T1 so if we do that for the T1 then we have minus delta T times the R1 and the R1, that is this here. So that will be then the uh, alpha <coughs> delta uh, x squared 
times a T2, and that is then at the new time level, um, minus 3T1 n plus 1, n plus 2T8, right? And that is then uh, this part here, and that is equal to the T1n. That is, we are at the first, uh, in the first set. So, and uh, the term that is appearing here, that is the, what we call the R, the von Neumann number. The thermal diffusivity times delta T divided by delta X squared. So then we get a relation um, for the unknowns in cells 1 and 2, and uh, this is something that will be constant, that will be, uh, we can write that on the right hand side. So then we will get, what we'll get, we'll get for the T1, let's see that, the T1 will have a 1 here, and it will have a minus, minus, that will be a plus, 3 times R, so we will have a 1 plus 3R times T1, and plus 1, and then we will have something with T2, that is just this one here, so it is minus R T2 N plus 1 is equal to, this is what we have already there, the T1 N, and we will move this one over. So it is here with a minus, so it gets with a plus on the right hand side, so you get a plus 2 R T8. So we can call that equation that we have not yet seen as our 15A. So 15A. And we can do a similar derivation uh, for, the, uh, sec for the general case that we have essentially already done. Um, and the result would be, if we do that, 15B, that we start then with a Tj minus 1, that will get, you see it here, if that will be moved over, get, get a minus, and with, by multiplying by delta t, we also get the r appearing here, so we, get, we will get the minus r tj minus 1 n plus 1 plus, and on the diagonal, we'll get uh, the 1 from i here, and we will get times delta t, moved on the right hand side, the minus 2 r. And that will be on the right hand side, get it plus. So we get what? Plus 2R, Tj, and plus 1. And then we will also get the minus R, Tj, plus 1, and plus 1 is equal to the Tj, n. So that is what we get for, the, for J between 2 and Nj plus 1. Minus one, of course. And then the last one is the one at here, the right boundary, 15C, and that will then involve the terms that we have here. We'll see, we'll get here the uh, Tnj minus one involved. It gets on the left hand side, so it'll appear as a minus r Tnj minus one, n plus one. Plus, and then we will get this here on the left hand side with a plus, so we get the 3 there, and we have 1 from the Tnj um, uh, n plus 1, so we get 1 plus 3r Tnj n plus 1 is equal to, and on the right hand side we will have the old value at the old time level, and we will have the boundary condition. That is the, this guy here, and that will stay on the right hand side, so it gets a plus 2RT. So then we have here the description of our implicit Euler method to solve the finite, the finite volume method with the implicit Euler method in time. So, what is this? If you look at it carefully, you'll see this defines a linear system. 
you see we have here, these are our unknowns, the T1, T2, the Tj's, J minus 1 plus 1 and so on, and we can get that into a system of equations. So that is what we do now, that we write that as a system of equations. So the equations that we derived for the finite volume method solved by the implicit Euler method in time, that is the these equations 15, so they correspond to uh, the following tri-diagonal linear system. that we will call equation 16. So then we start collecting what we have and getting that into matrix form. So we'll, here we will try to define a matrix. Here we will have our vector of unknowns and that will start with a T1 n plus 1. That is our first one. The next one is T2 n plus 1 and so on. We will add them as we work on. And on the right hand side, we will have the right hand side of the linear system. So we start here. So what will be the first entry in the diagonal in the first row, the 1 plus 3 on. So that will get here. And that will multiply the T1 n plus 1. Then the next entry that is number 2 in the first row is minus r because that will multiply the t2. Okay, and the rest is 0. Nothing appearing else. The right hand side we have nicely there in 15a. That is the our approximation to the temperature in cell 1 at the old time level n plus 2 times r times the boundary temperature, the left boundary. Okay, number two. Number two, we can use the B here, and then the J will be two. So we'll have here the T1, T2, T3. So then we see here the coefficients that we'll have, we will be in that second row, minus R, one plus two R, and minus R. So that then we'll have here minus R, one plus two R, minus R, and zero, and so on. And the right hand side will be done here, T2. And that will proceed all the way down until Nj minus 1. For Nj minus 1, we can still use this. So that, that will be then Nj uh, minus 2, Nj minus 1, and Nj. So that means in the second last row, we will then have these coefficients. Let us start from the, from the right here. So the one will be minus r, and then we will have the, uh, we will have the 1 plus 2r in the diagonal, and we will have minus r. So these continue all the way down here. And they are then operating, here we will have then the T n j minus 1, n plus 1. So that will continue and we don't need the T, we need it, but we need here the T n j minus 1, n. So that is the last um, equation uh, that we can use 15b. And the very last one is then 15c, and there the coefficient that will be the very last one in the diagonal will be 1 plus 3r, and the left neighbor will be minus r. 
so that we'll gain, we will have here minus r and we will have 1 plus 3r. So here it is then n, and this then is multiplying here the t n j n plus 1. And the right hand side will be then the t n j n plus 2r t b. So n here. And that will be our right hand side vector. And the rest here in the matrix, I didn't note it. Here we will have zeros all the way, zeros all the way, and the rest here, everything is zero. So we have just three diagonal, therefore the name tri diagonal, three diagonals. The center diagonal, which has mostly 1 plus 2r, except for the upper left and the lower right elements, which are 1 plus 3r, and the upper and lower subdiagonals have only minus r in it. So that defines then the tridiagonal linear system. So we can summarize the implicit Euler method applied to solve the finite body method in time leads to a tridiagonal linear system. We can call the matrix that we have here, we call, can call that A, and we can call this here the vector T n plus 1. T is now again considered as a vector, and the right hand side we call it as right hand side. And we note that that will be mostly, in our case, when we assume T a to be constant, it will only be at the old time level because our approximations here are all at the old time level. If we had time dependency, then these would be at the new time level. In our case. We don't discuss that here. Okay, so what can we say about this? First, it is a, a simple, it's a banded matrix, it has only three diagonals, so we have anything, the rest is zero. It's an example of a sparse matrix. So that is uh, obvious, but we have a very nice property when we look carefully, and those who had, uh, had the term before had heard the term before, it is diagonally dominant, this matrix A, because what is in the diagonal, the diagonal elements are larger than the sum of the absolute values of the off diagonals. And that is a very good property because then we have a, a nice algorithm to solve this very efficiently. And that is a method that is frequently used in CFD. So let us note this property first, diagonal dominance. What is that? So we write this property, A is diagonally dominant. And that means the following, that is essentially what I'm giving now, the definition of diagonal dominance. Since I, I use the following, called diagonal dominance, it has uh, two definitions to it. One, both must be fulfilled. The first one is, that the absolute value of the diagonal element AII must be larger than the sum of the absolute values of the off diagonals. So then we go from 1 to, in our case, NJ, and J should not be equal I. That is the row that we consider. And then we have here the absolute values of AIJ. That must be true for all i that, are, that we have in our linear system. And, that is important, for at least one i, we must have a sharper condition. That is the following, for the DDD, that the absolute value of the diagonal element must be larger than, not equal, larger equal, but larger than 
the sum of the absolute values of the off elements. So these two properties, they have to be fulfilled such that we can call a matrix diagonally dominant. Let us check that for our matrix. So I is equal to 1. A11 is 1 plus 3R. First off the diagonal, which is then the A12, is minus R. Absolute value is R. So 1 plus 3R is clearly larger than R. Here we have nothing, it's 0. So it's fulfilled. For these here, we will have 1 plus 2R is clearly larger than the absolute value of R, of minus R, which is R, plus the absolute value of minus R, which is R. So that means these, in this example, for the second to the row nj plus 1, this is 1 plus 2R, and this is 2R. So then, we have this fulfilled even for all i, in our case. It is enough to have it fulfilled for one i. In our case, it is fulfilled for all, because also in the last row, we have a similar situation as in the first one. So clearly, our matrix is diagonally dominant. If we have this property, we can use a very nice algorithm, and that is, as you probably know, the Thomas algorithm, or the TDMA. So that means, uh, since in our case uh, A uh, is the A very dominant, uh, the linear system, the triangular linear system, that is the system 16, can be solved by, and the first thing is, when we write it generally, it is the LU decomposition without pivoting. That is the general way for solving a linear system by a direct method, using LU decomposition. It's essentially Gauss elimination, but in a clever way. And, but we don't need pivoting. We don't need to interchange rows, that means without pivoting. And the algorithm um, that we then use, if we do that, is we use then, then we, it can be solved then by the Thomas algorithm. Which is also called, uh, also called, let's see. <coughs> Try the Hignal matrix algorithm or TDMA. CFT people like to use the term TDMA, the uh, applied mathematicians, numerical analysis, like to call it Thomas algorithm. What is the nice thing with that? The nice thing is when you do it, and we have done that in the course introduction to CFT, and I hope you have that done in a similar course, it takes only about eight times NJ uh, floating point operations. So, um, the solution takes only about eight times NJ floating point operations. Floating point 
operations are plus, minus, times, and divided. So time, sometimes you find the acronym FLOP for that. FLOPs is usually uh, floating point operations per second. That is uh, giving you an indication of the uh, uh, speed of your computer. But here it means that we have to do eight, about 8 times nj uh, floating point operations. It is, it's a little unfair because these operations are relatively fast, plus minus times. This is usually taking much longer, but they are counted the same. It gives an indication on the work that you have to do to solve it. And it is nice because it scales with the number of unknowns. If we would solve it by a classical, a full LU decomposition, we would, have, we would need of the order of nj to the power 3 operations. So this is a big difference when we have nj very large. So it means you can solve a problem if you have it like that, linear scaling, or you cannot solve it if you have a scaling like nj to the power 3. So it would not make sense here to use that. Okay, so then we have seen how we can use the implicit order method to solve the final volume method in time. And from this point of view, so the solution is just the same as if we had uh, the finite difference method. And the only difference is that in our case, uh, we have the entries in the, um, in the diagonal, and also the right hand side, are a little bit different in the first and last rows from the finite difference method. Otherwise, it's just the same. Okay, so then. And that will be an optional exercise, by the way, in, in uh, exercise 2, to solve the heat conduction problem that we have considered in exercise 1, not only with the explicit Euler method, but also with the implicit Euler method. And in MATLAB, by the way, we have also nice tools to define the uh, matrices, uh, the diag command for abbreviation for diagonal, and that gives you a chance to define the this uh, triangle matrix uh, very quickly and efficiently. Instead, we want to look at other options for solving the finite volume method in time. And option number three, after explicit Euler method, was our first option two, implicit Euler method, we have option three, that is the crank Nicholson method. In a sense, it is the average of explicit and implicit oil. So the recipe is that we do the time discretization in the usual way. Time, our unknown at the new time level minus at the old time level divided by the time step size delta t. On the right hand side, we now use an average of the right hand side vector where we first evaluated it at the old time level and then at the new time level. So, and that is then giving us the crank Nicholson map. The stencil for that is then the following. If we write the x on the coordinate. And sister and uh, T. Then we will be it will be involving the values at x j and at x j minus one and at x j plus one through this here. Of course, there we need these values at the old time level. We assume that this is the time level the time instant n times delta t, and we want to go to n plus 1 delta t. n plus 1 delta t, so that is then the new time level. And there also the values, both at the cell that we want to evaluate and the neighboring cells are involved in the formula through this right-hand side evaluated at the new time level. That will involve the t j 
plus minus n plus 1, as well as the value j uh, at tj itself. So then the stencil will be, look like this. So both the values in the cell at the old and new time level are involved and the neighbors, both at the old and the new time level. So what are the properties of the Frank-Nicholson method? method solved with the Crank-Nicholson method in time. Regarding accuracy, we have now the nice property that the method is now second order in time and space. Space we had already before, but all the other method, methods that we discussed so far, they were only first order in time, explicit implicit order method. But this method is second order in time. That means it is more accurate. And then regarding stability, we can show that it is unconditionally stable. <coughs> And that is, uh, as we said already yesterday, that means it is stable for all delta t larger than zero. So we can choose any time step size as we want. But there is a but, and the but is that we will get oscillations if we choose large, very large ones. understand that when we do the stability analysis and look at the amplification factor. The amplification factor gets then for any wave number, I think except for the wave number zero, to minus one. That means it flips from plus to minus from each time step to the next. And that is not nice if you want to have the steady state solution. So therefore when you want to have a steady state the steady state solution, don't use Crank Nicholson, use implicit oil. That is fine. Otherwise, if we have, uh, if we stay in lower, we take lower the delta t, then this will be more accurate than both the explicit and the implicit Euler method. Regarding the solution, it will involve similar technique as the implicit Euler method, but uh, we we'll also have. Uh, uh, right hand side that will involve also more terms because we also do this criticization explicitly. Now, in our overview, I want also to mention a nice method for unsteady flow computations that does not suffer from this property that you can use if you like for large time steps, but then you must always check that it is okay that you get the time accuracy right. But that, that the method is nice and uh, stable and not uh, oscillatory for large time steps. And that is the uh, backward differentiation formula. The acronym is uh, F. There are a couple of these methods, but the most common one in CFD is the BDF2, that is the second order one, that looks the following. Now we do a different discretization, that is the catch here, a different discretization of the dt, the time derivative of temperature, or whatever quantity you want to, uh, to solve for here, we solve for temperature. So here we take them three times the value at the new time level, minus four times the value at the old time level, and that is unique here, we take also the time level before into account, t n minus one. Then we divide by two times delta t. And that can be shown as a second order approximation of the time derivative of 
temperature. And on the right hand side we have, as for the implicit Euler method, the right hand side of the new time value. So that is then what it looks like. If we look for the stencil, we have x, and now we need also to involve a little more. We have to go a little down a little more. If we are at the time level uh, n, this is n delta t, this is n plus 1 delta t, we will now also involve n minus 1 delta t. It will also be involved. It will be involved through this value here. So that will be here. Here we have the, uh, that is the, the xj. Here we have the xj plus 1. Here we have the xj minus 1. So the values at the, the cell j will be involved here at time level n and n minus 1. And of course at time level n n plus 1, but this will also involve the neighboring, the neighbors, at uh, n, uh, at j minus 1 and at j plus 1. So these guys will be involved, and now this is the difference to, x, to implicit order that also the time level n minus 1 will be involved. So what are then the properties of this method? Frank-Nicholson is second order both in time and space. Second order in time and space. So that is, again, that is what it shares with the Frank-Nicholson. And it is also unconditionally stable. And the nice thing is then what I already mentioned, there are, does not have oscillations. No oscillations for large delta T. But it has a disadvantage to start. We cannot start it immediately. We need, um, when we start from n equal uh, to zero, we need first to advance it one time step because when we want to compute T2, it needs T1 and T0. So that means we need to, uh, the first, uh, to, accomplish, to accomplish first the solution at the first time level with another method. We cannot use it with a BDF. It's a so-called multi-step method, this BDF. But it needs T0 and T1 to start. So that means we have to use some other method, for example, the Crank Nicholson or the implicit Euler method to get it started. So one trick could be to use the implicit Euler method with smaller time steps to compensate for the low accuracy. Or if you just use it for one step, probably the implicit uh, the Crank Nicholson would also be okay. But anyway, it's a, it's a disadvantage to have to start with another method. Okay, so now we have a, a brief overview over some methods that can be used to solve the finite volume method for the heat conduction equation. The next step is uh, numerical analysis. And that is a step I can jump over because we have had that in the introduction to CFP. So those of you who followed that course, for you, uh, the following next exercise where we do the consistency and the stability analysis to get convergence will just be repetition. For those of you who have not yet had that in your equivalent course, please read that either in the lecture notes or in the book. 
there you will find um, chapters on the stability analysis using the von Neumann stability analysis and uh, using uh, computing the truncation error to see whether the uh, numerical method that we are dealing with is consistent. When we do this analysis, we do the analysis for the uh, finite difference method that is equivalent to the finite volume method that we have derived. In our case, we saw we get exactly the finite difference method for the interior uh, cells. So then we do the analysis on that. That is fine. So that is something now I can uh, just say that uh, please uh, read that yourself if you, you haven't had it and learn it. It's important. And uh, that will allow us to move on uh, now uh, quicker than um, otherwise. So we would save a little time by that. But again, I would like to stress, please read it and learn it and ask us uh, in the uh, guidance hours or in the lessons, wherever, if you have questions on that. Uh, okay. Question? Yes. Which chapter is it? Uh, in the lecture notes, it is, uh, I think, 3.5. Let's see, I have my lecture notes somewhere. Yeah, here yeah, they are. Yes, it is in the lecture notes, it is chapter 3.5. This morning, in the uh, lesson, I found out that apparently it has not come through to everybody how to get the lecture notes. If you go to the course information, or in Norwegian Fag Information, then you find an, uh, a link where you can get the lecture notes. You have to give uh, a username, so you go, or you go to this home page uh, that is referenced, or you can also go to my personal home page, there I have a link to the old home page of the course. So, I have unfortunately at the moment again a problem with the projection. I have to fix that. Ask somebody for help during the break. Otherwise, I could show you this directly, but we can do it also this way. So, you can go to um, my homepage. There you find uh, TEP 4165, old page. So you go there, and there you'll find it, I think, under syllabus. Or you simply go to the FAC information or the course information. And um, so I think it's syllabus. And there you find the uh, lecture notes, which are called Introduction to CFP. And um, there you have to give a username, and that is the course name in small letters. you are asked for a password and then you have LOS to CFD which has the double meaning uh, listening solution to CFD or LOS pilot to CFD so anyway that's something that uh, I have to get at that you can get to this also via the course information. So that is one way to go. The simpler way is go to the course information. So it's learning. And you go on course information. And there you find the link to this. Has uh, anybody had any problems in downloading that? No. Okay. Okay, then we take uh, 15 minutes.